My name is Paul Conway. I'm in the School of Education here in UL. I've been here for the last three or four years and most of my work is, as you might expect, involved in the education of teachers. And I also work uh, at EpiSTEM here, which is the National Centre for STEM Education. And I'm director of um, the PDMT, which is the out of field program or the program for out of field maths teachers. Um, and so far we've about 900 graduates of that. So they're teachers who are, let's say, uh, they have half a qualification or quarter of a quali qualification to teach mathematics. They come do the PDMT and then they get their, 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 their wings, so to speak, to teach mathematics. And it's been a very successful program, um, fully funded by the Department of Education Science, although it's gone into its final cycle, the final intake just two weeks ago into that. So we had six cohorts. Um, today what I'm going to talk about is the, the notion of um, good science teaching, but particularly in the case of physics and what I want to do actually there's only ever been one video study uh, comparing the teaching of physics across different countries so I'm really going to take that as a case study of the teaching of physics uh, and see what we can learn from that although there's been a number of video studies of teaching mainly maths since the mid 90s um, and so that's part of the context for this um, okay so again, thanks to IOP for the invitation and to my colleagues from EpiSTEM. I see a few here this morning. So that's good. Um, so what's good science teaching the case of physics, as I mentioned, is the focus. Um, so to start us off, um, this is a recent v uh, video. There's been quite a bit of debate about this video. Um, it's a study of graduates of, well, you'll see it. I won't say anything. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We are the premier engineering and science institution in the world. Do you think you could light a bulb with a battery and wire? Do you think you could light a bulb with a battery and wire? Yeah. Light a bulb a battery and a wire. Maybe. Yes. All right. Definitely. Do you think you can light a bulb with a battery and a wire? Battery and wire? Well, yes, why not? Okay. Definitely. Okay, can you do that? The interesting part about the batteries and bulbs question is that people always predict that they can do it. Students say, of course I can do this. Uh, any hints I should have here? Teachers say, of course my students can do this. Oh! Do you know why that didn't work? I have no idea. Battery could be dead, the bulb could be bad, I'm hooking it up totally <laughs> incorrectly. I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer. But if I had to guess, I would say it's operator error. <laughs> okay. I know it's possible, but I don't know how to do it. It's only after failing that you begin to get upset with the question and think, well, maybe it's a trick question, maybe this has something to do with manipulating the wires, they couldn't hold all the wires together. You don't have a current if you only have one wire, you need to complete a closed circuit. But that's not the case. Oh, uh, well, if I do it with a little light bulb, I just do this. <laughs> In which case, the, the light just lights up. It goes to the fundamental understanding of electricity. If one cannot light a light bulb with a battery and wire, then everything built upon those basic ideas has problems. We've always assumed that if teachers teach, students will learn. You can't assume that what's blatantly obvious to you and has always been blatantly obvious to you is going to be that way to somebody else, especially a kid. Uh, and uh, that's where you have to stop, regroup, and, and say, wait a second, is this really, is this really as self-evident as you'd like to think it is? Sometimes the simplest problems in science defy intuition, and the most basic technology is surprisingly difficult to grasp. Is it because we weren't taught? Or is it because of something deeper? Something about the way we think. Good video. Yeah, it's interesting. It's thought-provoking. 
That's really an example of a set of videos that have been on the go for the last 30 years. The Harvard Smithsonian Project on Science Education has been developing videos like that. Has anybody come across a video called Private Universe? No, if we have time at the end, I might take a look at it. It's a video from 30 years ago, and the qu simple question posed to, to st actually to graduates of, of, of uh, Harvard was, uh, why are there seasons? Amazing set of answers. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, so there's been recent commentary and debate just around this video. Somebody said it was a setup. If you look at the bottom, you know, somebody said, that's a setup. These guys were just stitched up, you know, it seems unfair. How would you dare do this to the graduates of one of the greatest universities in the world? Uh, so then an article by um, a graduate of MIT talked about some of the people he knew who were, who were, who were in, in, the, uh, in the video and some of the professors there. He said, Rob noted that our instinct when faced with a problem should be to get more information. He pointed out, and he was critical of the, 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 the video because it didn't seem to give people an opportunity to ask more questions, although one or two did. I had a couple of questions I would have returned with. What is the battery voltage and current sourcing capability? What are the operational characteristics of the bulb, including voltage and current? The uh, wire thing had me concerned as well. Why not two wires? But seriously, MIT grads can't work this out? So as I said, it's, it's an example of the uh, similar video studies or video vignettes since the 1980s, and they're, they're really well worth looking at. If you're interested in those, the Annenberg Foundation has an absolutely fabulous website uh, where you can source a lot of those. And not, you can buy some of them. A lot of them you have to buy, but you can actually access a lot of them without, without, without paying. So it's a good resource for the teaching of physics at second or third level. So what I want to do is just to take that example and just think about it from the point of view of teaching. My background is in educational psychology, so I'm interested in learning and cognition. And so, for example, one of the fundamental questions over the last 30 years has been what do teachers need, need to know to teach well? So that's been answered in a variety of different ways. No, no surprise there's an emphasis on content knowledge. Right. No surprise either that there'll be an emphasis on concepts central to teaching across most subjects. You mightn't maybe identify the next concept from education psychology, which is known as pedagogical content knowledge. And that's seen as a type of knowledge that's particular to teaching and teachers. It's that knowledge that allows teachers to identify how to represent diff uh, uh, concepts in different ways, evaluate different representations of concepts, and then also anticipate and plan for the difficulty students will have in learning those concepts. So it's, a, it's an amalgam of knowledge, it's a composite of teacher knowledge that brings together pedagogy and content knowledge. And one of the interesting findings from studies in the late, it was, this was conceptualized in the mid 80s, and then following 10 years, people were saying, well, does teacher education make a difference? Teacher edu ed education appears to add value to pedagogical content knowledge. That's a good thing. We'd hope people going through teacher ed programs get better at PCK. And then cognitive activation is really the, the subset of PCK. It's that part of it where teachers can focus on the uh, difficulties and difficulty level of tasks. So I want to use those few concepts as a kind of insight on the video study which I'm going to talk about, which is a comparison, uh, a video study of the teaching of physics in Finland, Germany, and German-speaking Switzerland. It's the only ever stu such study. Uh, previous studies in the 90s were on the teaching of eighth grade mathematics uh, between Germany, the USA, and, and Japan. And th that was the pioneering study, the Tim's video study in the mid-90s. So other studies have followed on. In fact, there's been one Irish study as well. It was called Inside Classrooms in about 2003. It compared uh, 20 teachers of maths and 10 teachers of English and looked at, I think, at half a dozen lessons from each teacher. So it was quite an extensive study, about 400,000 funding for that study. One of the things they found was, for instance, that teacher talk in maths classrooms was, guess how many percent? 92% of the talk in maths classrooms at junior cycle was teachers talking and students were only 8%. That's an enormous amount of teacher talk. And the idea is that when you have so much teacher talk, you don't have opportunities for students to engage and reason uh, mathematically because there's so much teacher talk going on. So, like I said, um, what, what ought we look at in, in, in uh, these video lessons? PCK is an obvious thing to look for in terms of how do teachers uh, shape up in terms of pedagogical content knowledge. And so, as I said, a subset of that is cognitive activation, which is the ways of presenting content, content evaluating different ways of presenting content, 
and then estimating the difficulty of the content. So and kind of just putting these out ideas out there now, we'll come back to them in looking at the study. So the interest in learner understanding and achievement in science, you know, it wasn't here 100 years ago. It's really only in the last 60 years that people have been paying serious attention to how do learners understand uh, and think and reason in science. And a lot of it really can be traced back, as many of you are probably familiar, to the Sputnik uh, era in the late 50s when, when Russia got into space ahead of the USA. And that prompted in the USA an amazing response. In fact, the, 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 the legislation that was passed in 1958 was called the National Education Defense Act in the USA, right? which in itself is very interesting. As I mentioned, there's been work on misconceptions since the 1980s. But again, it's an example of this focus on students' understanding and reasoning. And the Annenberg Foundation resources are there for you to look at. And so there's the reaction to Sputnik. Uh, initially, President Eisenhower dismissed the feat and said, oh, look, it's not a big deal. But eventually, there was kind of a dawning realization that this could be a threat to US supremacy. So NASA was founded, and then the National Defe Defense Education Act was passed in 1958. And that prompted huge investment in science and maths education. And for instance, the National Science Foundation in the USA, they fund a lot of maths and science education research Interestingly, in Ireland, SFI don't fund education research or yeah, education research, be it in maths or science or any of the STEM. They do fund outreach and communication, but they don't really fund uh, 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 education research in maths and science in the way I think they ought to. And it, it leaves a gap, I think, in the, in the system. Um, this interest in, in how countries are doing compared to one another, uh, not just uh, economically, of course, it's in education. Many of you are familiar with PISA. How many of you have heard of PISA? Pretty much everybody. Uh, if you remember in 2009, Ireland did very poorly and we went into what we might call PISA shock. And uh, a response to that was the literacy numeracy strategy in 2011 in Ireland. And also, if you uh, remember the, the, what was called the dip for teachers. Did anybody do the dip here? A few. It's now two years. It was one year. Directly in response to how Ireland did from the 2009 PISA when we went from 5th to 21st in literacy in particular. Huge response to it. But it's, it's, I suppose, a case in point of countries pay enormous attention to the international comparative dimension of education now. It's a, you might call it a kind of a cognitive Olympics. Uh, so you'll see Finland is, is right at the top there, very close to the top in science. And that was the basis for this video study I'm going to focus on because Germany and Switzerland said, What's, what are these guys in Finland doing that we're not doing? So like the lesson video study in maths in the mid 90s. They said, let's look at a series of uh, teach one topic in, in, in uh, physics, video it, I think two lessons, and they had a few dozen teachers in each, each of the countries. And then they did in-depth analysis of those, those lessons with a the, with the framework to look at, to, 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 to observe the lessons. You see Ireland there is in the middle of the pack uh, in, in science education or in science literacy, a bit better in reading. That was, it's amazing that you know in 2009, Ireland was 21st, it's three of 35 in 2015, but there was huge changes in the education system in response to one bad set of scores, because Ireland's scores typically in literacy were quite high, they were in the top you know, quarter, but just one, one dip, huge response nationally. Um, the, the, the title of the talk today is Quest and Question, uh, but I also have given it science here. The ION is relevant here as well. And it's actually important because um, an ION has a charge. And good teaching has a charge to you. You know you're in a classroom where there's good teaching going on. If there's an emotional charge, a cognitive charge. There's an engagement, if you will. So, uh, so we can think of a quest then as a long, arduous search. A question you know, is a sentence worded or expressed to elicit information and requiring a resolution or discussion. And I think when we think about the issue of good teaching, we're never going to solve the problem of good teaching, but we might come up with better ways of thinking about it. And that's what these video studies contribute, I think, stronger and better ways of thinking about, 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 about good teaching. And so this is a study of good teaching at second level, but it probably has relevance for third level as well. Um, okay, so just, boy, I'll leave that. Okay, so here's the video study, quality of instruction in physics. Um, and it, the, the video study actually itself was done, I think, 2007 to 2009. And these video studies, they're, they, you know, they're 
complete it slowly because it takes so long to analyze the data. Uh, one of my brothers is a, a journalist and he, he accuses me of writing at the pace of an oxen uh, compared to, to journalists who churn out stuff at an amazing pace, but academics is a little bit slower. Um, so if we're trying to understand good teaching, uh, as you'll see, there's too much on that slide, too much going on there. In a way, that's you know, pointing to the complexity of understanding good teaching. So on the left there, I'll just do a quick tour. You have the teacher, uh, the teacher's content knowledge, their pedagogical content knowledge, the competence for diagnosis, engagement, pedagogical orientation, all those various different aspects of, of teachers, right? Instruction, right? In, in the second box in the middle there, classroom management, climate, uh, orientation, activation to learn, etc. And then you have these, let's say, e e exogenous variables such as family structure, and then you have the individual student, and then you have um, underneath that in the, on the, the right, you've got mediation processes, motivation, the learning activity, you have out of school, you know, it's very complex. Now we're not going to look at all that. All I'm going to do is look at a piece of that, which is the, um, in the middle box there, you'll see the surface and deep structure. And in this video study, they spent quite a lot of time looking at, when they looked at the videos, they said, okay, what's happening time-wise in the videos? What type of interaction going on in the classroom? That's the surface structure. And then they wanted to get underneath that surface structure. They started to look at the way the concepts are developed. Are they developed quickly? And then do, do teachers move on? Uh, is there um, a real, if you will, incremental building of the concept? So while you might have the same surface structure, is there a different deep structure to lessons. So that was the focus in these video studies, to try and get it underneath the, in, and inside the actual learning orientation. And the reason for this framework is that in the 1995 video study, uh, the comparison between Japan and the USA was fascinating because what it found was that in the US classrooms, teachers tended to demonstrate a procedure and then provide individual practice for students. And the teachers in the US were superb at that. The demo the procedure and individual practice or guided practice. In the Japanese classrooms, Japan had done much, much better in those international comparative tests in the mid-90s. Completely different, what they called lesson script in Japan. Japanese teachers, by and large, started by posing a problem on the board and telling the students, I'm going to give you five or seven minutes now, get into groups, try and figure out that problem with little or no help from the teacher. It was a well-framed problem and it was a problem-posing lesson. That was the, the, and the lessons tended to be uh, what they called slow and sticky in Japan, whereas in the US they were fast and snappy. So it was, here's the demo, get into your groups, practice, compare, quite a different pattern and pace. So this idea of lesson scripts was the big uh, insight from the math study of Japan and the USA. So in this video study of physics, they were again trying to unpack the script of the lessons and link that then to student outcomes. So that's the middle box here, the instruction part. So you have the surface structure, which will look at classroom interaction and maybe practical work. And then beneath that then, uh, so the surface structure is the top two classroom interaction and practical work. You know, everybody in physics by and large and science would see practical work as good. It's almost a universal good. Um, but it's, it's really just part of the, the surface structure. And the deep structure then is the, the structure of the ideas, uh, the motivation support, the class management, uh, the stu teacher-student interaction, the cognitive activation is how do teachers uh, plan for and appraise the difficulty of tasks and give feedback around that. Right. So I'm really going to focus on, actually, is there, the pointer is gone. Okay. Um, so I'm going to focus on, on that box in the middle, really, with the outcomes piece uh, we know about because Phil ended better. So that I mentioned the Tim's video study. Again, another way to summarize the, the difference between Japan and the USA uh, in the mid-90s was the higher achieving countries, Singapore, Japan in the mid-90s, implemented a range of high-level tasks and maintained the demands of the task. So the teachers in Japan and Singapore in the mid-90s in maths, they were able to pitch the lesson at a high level. So the problem posing start of the lesson pitched at a high level. And they were able to maintain that cognitive demand through the lesson. So, to summarise, th this looking at lessons then, there's a surface and deep structure. The teaching time, the lesson phases, the type of interaction. 
So the you know, type of interaction could be was there group work, right? And so, and then the deep is the learning process orientation, concept building, learning by experience, and cognitive activation. So what they found in the video study was that when it came to surface structure, there were few differences. So in that sense, when you started looking at the videos initially, it's, well, they're all doing more or less the same thing. The timing didn't, wasn't, of teaching time wasn't that different. The lesson phases, there's kind of, you know, broadly similar uh, lesson phases. And the type of interaction, so there was pair work and group work and uh, whole class teaching. Now, at the same time, when they began to delve a little deeper, they noticed there was, for example, in Finland, more teacher-centered lessons and more repetition and assessment. Just, so there were some differences. I'll get into those in a bit more. So um, um, it's a complex study, and I'm not going to go into all the measures they had. They had some paper and pencil tests for teachers. We know there was obviously the student outcomes uh, in terms of, of, of achievement uh, from, from, from PISA and other uh, international comparative tests. Um, and so in, in terms of the, the core video focus, it was video of two lessons on electrical energy and power. So not dissimilar to the MIT, actually. study. Same kind of focus. And so when it came to teachers' post-measurement, they looked at PCK and content knowledge, and then students' content knowledge scientific inquiry. So you can see it was a very big study, but I'm just really going to look at the quality of instruction piece based on the videos. Um, so that's a kind of summary of the dimensions of PCK. And so you'll see the PCK dimension on the left there and the instructional aspect on the right. So the knowledge about difficulties, the instructional aspect is cognitive activation. Um, and there's just the range of instruments that were used in that. So a lot of data gathered here. That's why it takes so long to analyze all this. Um, so for instance, one of the things they were trying to do then in understanding where teachers were at vis-a-vis -vis their, their own knowledge was to look at how uh, teachers understood misconceptions. So these items were... Uh, administered to teachers and so look at the circuit diagram below what is the reading on a meter etc please write down all the student answers you would expect if you set this task please number each student response so that you can refer back to it easily so that idea that teachers can uh, can identify the difficulties and a plan for those is central to good teaching right and so that was that was measured and assessed um, analogies, again, teachers' capacity to identify analogies was, was, was uh, seen as very important. So that was assessed. So what do they find? Uh, okay, this is the sample. So you see just the mix of there's different types of schools in the different countries. Um, there was more uh, classrooms in Germany and Switzerland, but they still had a good sample across the three countries. So what do you think happened in relation? Which country scored highest in PCK, would you say? Well, Finland, yes, scored highest in uh, the student achievement. So we might anticipate that PCK was highest there. So let's uh, just say that. <coughs> what happened in terms of the emphasis on concepts and lessons across the three countries, would you say? Oh, it's interesting just to think about. And what country scored highest in cognitive activation? So well, I'm going to leave that. So, do, 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 do. okay, so... In terms of concept building, what they did was they, they subdivided or parsed lessons into different levels of concept building. When most or a lot of the lesson was on concept building or just the introduction only or continuing and rarely. And you'll see here uh, on the right there, you'll see the, the, the country codes. So effectively uh, in Switzerland and Germany, it was mainly concept building. So when they looked at the deep structure, there was more of a focus on, there was more a mainly concept building focus in lessons. Um, whereas in, in uh, Germany, you can see just concept building as introducing part was higher and concept building as a continuing part and then rarely concept building, right? That uh, high block or high uh, yeah, block in, 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 in on, the, on the right. So rarely concept building was a feature of a lot of German lessons and what were we, so if it, they weren't in concept building what were they doing they were doing something called learning by experience so they were sort of in engagement in extended practical work but without the conceptual minds on focus that was being seen in Finland so there was a distinction then between concept building and learning uh, learning as by experience so you can see that in the bottom bar there it's the white one the LE 
so when, when there was rarely concept building, you had a lot of the learning by experience. So it, it looked like there was a lot going on. It looked possibly progressive and innovative because there was maybe lots of practical work. But when it came to the development of ideas and concepts, that wasn't happening to the same extent as lessons, where it was mainly concept building. So in terms of PCK, interestingly, it wasn't Finland on top, it was actually Germany. So that prompted the researchers to look at what's the relationship between cognitive activation and pedagogical content knowledge, because you might have anticipated Finland will be at the top. Um, so what they found was that the cognitive activation, that's uh, the teacher's capacity to appraise the difficulty and, and respond to that in classrooms. Yes, teachers in Finland were more adept at doing that than in either Germany or Switzerland. And so what they found then is there were two pathways between PCK and student knowledge, one direct pathway and then one mediated by cogn cognitive activation. So to summarize, the, the, the key lessons here from this the only ever video study of the teaching of physics in the world and just comparing Finland and Germany. In Finland, and this is interesting, the lessons tend to be teacher-centered, well-structured, mainly focused on concept building and little learning by experience with many connections between concepts made by the teacher, and there was a lot of summarizing and reflecting. So going, remember going back to the Japan versus the USA? There, this video study, when you get to the deep structure level, it's picking up on the subtle cultural dynamics of the lesson, even if the surface structure looks the same. And then in Germany, the lessons were student-centered, little summarizing and reflecting, focus on learning by experience with long phases of practical work, but maybe hands-on practical work, but not minds-on practical work, and a small number of concepts covered and few connections made between concepts. You can see cumulatively over time how the work of teaching and the opportunities to learn would be different across these different uh, school systems, even if the surface structure looks very similar. I mean, my question to, to us here in Ireland would be, which country do we think we will be most like in the teaching of physics? Would we be more like Finland, with its emphasis on concept building and cognitive activation? Or more like Germany, where we really have lots of uh, practical work, uh, long, um, yeah, without much connection made between concepts by teachers or students? So, some ideas to think about for us in, in teaching. Uh, looking at lessons appears to be worthwhile. These video studies, they're very costly, they take a long time but they appear to present us with very helpful ways of thinking about teaching and good teaching. Um, one of the things that seems to come out of these studies, whether it was the Tim's video study in the 90s or the uh, QUIP study, was that there's a shape to lessons. When you look at the deep structure, there appears to be a shape to lessons, a script to lessons that can be very informative for thinking about teaching, thinking about teacher education. So that surface deep structure distinct distinction appears to be helpful and then something to leave us thinking, pondering about. Um, how would teaching of physics in Ireland compare? When I asked, and I showed uh, maths education students, sorry, maths, um, maths teachers, the Japanese and maths, the Japanese and USA maths teaching, they by and large said that the teaching of maths in Ireland was way more like the US than it was Japan, Jap Japanese teachers. That was interesting. So in the sense that in Ireland we tend to do demo and practice very like the US as opposed to problem posing. That, that was interesting. So when it comes to physics, where would, how would we compare? Are we more like Finland, more like Germany? If we take Finland as more desirable in this instance. Is there a focus on concept building, that extended concept building starting out in early in the lesson and being maintained across the lesson? And then the, the, the part of that maintenance of the, co the high level of demand is the, the level of cognitive activation and teacher's capacity to, to assess to plan, anticipate, and then enact this very subtle, nuanced engagement with students around ideas. So I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.